getting results. Welcome back to News 6 at 9. If you are just joining us, we've committed the day to talk about mental health and how we're doing. As a reminder, representatives from the Mental Health Association of Central Florida are on hand to take your calls and answer your questions right now and all day long here at News 6. You can call 888-436-6665 right now to speak to one of our representatives. Of course, as we continue to talk about mental health today, one of the elephants in the room, so to speak, the mental health of our law enforcement officers and first responders. That's right. We know they're out there every day helping people in some of the worst moments they're going through and at the same time seeing things most of us can't even relate to. Yeah, but at the end of the day, who asks them if they're okay? Like kind of who checks on the people that do the checking? So Trooper Steve, as our in-house first responder, and you know many, you know more than many of us how how the day-to-day -day struggles can be for law enforcement, for first responders. Yeah, that's right. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a crazy situation out there, and there are moments that stick in your mind forever as law enforcement officers. We are reminded of that just last week when, tragically, a three-year-old Volusia County child accidentally took their own life. Volusia County Sheriff Mike Chitwood spoke about the concerns for his deputies. So I sat down with him to just see how they're doing. Sheriff, last week uh, you held a press conference and it was pertaining to a pretty serious call that happened here in Volusia County, something I would define as the definition of tragic. Mm -hmm. Throughout that press conference, you're, you're never short of words, but you said something that really stuck out to, I think, the community and to a lot of members of the media that you were concerned about the mental health of your deputies. My biggest concern out of all of this is the mental and physical health of my deputies and my dispatchers and the evac personnel that responded. Talk to me a little bit about that. You know, almost probably 85% of what we do when we respond to a call, there is some type of mental health issue going on that we're asked to deal with. Nobody ever asked us, are you okay? You know, uh, I've been doing this over 35 years and it's the old, well, you know, this is our job, rub a little dirt on it, have a couple cocktails, go home and go to bed and wake up tomorrow and come out slugging. You're, it, it's just our job. Well, that's not really the way it is. And I think when you look at the number of vets who kill themselves, when you look at the number of police officers who kill themselves, it, this is real. PTSD is real. And I think every administrator in the country, whether you're a sheriff or a police chief, it's incumbent upon us to do everything humanly possible to provide the resources to our folks that are out there because you want them to retire in good mental and physical health. And it, and it starts the day they walk through the door of that academy of doing everything you can to try to protect their mental health, give them the resources they need. When it comes to pre intervention and post after a call like this. What are you guys doing here at the sheriff's office? Well, immediately that night, uh, I, I saw snippets of the body camera footage. It was really difficult to watch. And I have a deputy trying to perform CPR on a three-year-old who sustained massive head wounds. And then the second deputy comes to the door and tries to help that. She's covered in blood. There is no way no way whether they were 30-year players, I had one 30-year player there, or whether they were brand new with less than a year on the street. You could just tell by the sound of their voice, by looking at their snippets of body camera footage, by talking to the captain who was on scene, we got to get these people help and get them help now. Let's get them out of this situation. Let's bring our peer group. And that's the very first thing that happens is we have a peer group. It's made up of sergeants and deputies. There's, a, there's 10 of them. It's run by a lieutenant. Like so this is happening. This is happening. This happens within an hour. Got it. Within an hour, everything starts to settle down. We get them off the street, get them to a nice secure location, let them decompress, and then bring in their peers. And let's see how that works. Let's talk to them. Give them a couple of days off, follow up phone calls. Everybody's calling, everybody's checking on them. And then in the meantime, we have our HR personnel are scheduling a meeting with one of our psychologists. We have probably five or six psychologists. Uh, that we contract with. And a matter of fact, they're all going through that this week. But we avail that to them at all times and we rely on the psychologist telling us because my concern is having done this so long, the first 24 hours, the first 48 hours aren't really the problem. It's the two, three, four, five years down the line. What happens, God forbid, the next time they're, they're on scene where a child has drowned or there's a car crash or something similar occurs, 
what happens with that PTSD? That, that, what, what does that bring back? And does it destroy their careers? Does it destroy their lives? I've been in law enforcement 15 years myself, and there's always that, that one call, mm -hmm. still to this day, I can close my eyes and I can put myself on scene. If you have a moment like that that you're willing to share. In, in over 35 years of policing, I have those incidents where I wake up in the middle of the night, there's two homicide scenes in particular, one involving a six-year-old, one involving a 24-year-old medical student. And I, I, I don't know why, right. but there are certain things or they just trigger that and but it's because it's seared in your memory. Do you see having your own academy now more effective because you can almost begin the mental health training there and give them the tools before they show up here? But you're controlling it. 101%. We control what is going to happen. You are under our constant supervision for 28 weeks before you go out on the field training. So we get to see you, we get to know who you are. Part of our culture is that. It's not only critical incident training on how to uh, go out to a critical incident and deal with it, but it's what do you do for yourself? What is the health and wellness for yourself? How should you cope with this? How can you cope with this? What tools are there? And that's, that's what you wanna be able to do is give them the outlet and the tools and the support. There's no stigma to asking for help. There's no stigma to feeling sad. And, look, and, and contrary to what anybody may tell you, and you know this too, there is crying in police work. You're allowed to cry. You're allowed to show your emotions. Do you feel sometimes there is a, a sense of holding back because they don't want to be taken away from what they feel their purpose is? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, uh, and, and this is going to be derogatory, but it, in my Philadelphia days, it was called the rubber gun squad. That, that was the stigma that was attached. You know, if you talked about suicide, if you, if you, if you said any buzzword, you automatically seize his, seize his or her firearm and stick them in a, in a room with the rest of the crazies. Right. And, and I think that we've gone beyond that now, but there still is that. If I, if I were to go and say this, they're gonna take my gun. And, and you know, my response to that is, and we talk about this all the time, that, that, that's, that, that's not an embarrassment. You know, look at it as you're burned out and you need a break. You just need to see things in a different world because if you were a traffic homicide investigator and you came to me and said, or came to your supervisor and said, man, I, I cannot work another crash, we would, make, we would move you to a, a place where you wouldn't have to deal with that as, as best as you can. Maybe we'll, we'll move you to narcotics. Maybe we'll move you to the detective division. Maybe we'll move you to school resource officer because you served there well. Now part of that mental health is cycling through. And that's the other thing I think is important in an agency is cycling people through these high profile, high stress, things that are gonna wear you down. So for Sheriff Mike Chitwood, what do you do for your mental health? I ride like a banshee, man. I ride my bike like a nut. I ride probably 250, 300 miles uh, in a week. You know, I'm in the gym four days a week. I don't sleep well. Okay. Uh, some of that is self-induced. Some of it is that the phone's constantly ringing and you know, you're constantly in the move, you're constantly thinking about things. So for me, it, one, of the, one of the stressors being a second generation cop is my father was really into physical fitness. You know, he was a big runner, he was in the gym all the time. So I kind of learned from him that this was the best way to do it. And some of the people who I admired in the Philadelphia Police Department were triathletes and you know, they're like, hey, this is the best thing to do, kid. You know, you got done working midnight to eight, it was a tough tour, go out and run five miles. And you, when you believe me, when it all comes out, you'll sleep a lot better. And they were, and they were right. There's things like that, you know, surrounding yourself with your family, getting out there and, and, and working out. And everybody's different. Somebody may be in the arts, right. you know, somebody That's may be in meditation. Right, you gotta have something outside of what you do. As the head of this agency, what could you say to the community to, to almost allow them in, to show, hey, look, we're people too. We hire from the human race. So we're those people in the community that we're talking about that have mental health issues, we're hiring those folks. There's mental health issues in their family, so we're no different. Just because you put a badge on, a magical thing doesn't happen to you, and you now become this superhuman being who doesn't have all these, all of these issues. So there is that 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 we're all in this game, this game together. We hire from the human race. That is what stuck out to me the entire mm -hmm. time during that interview, and we all know Sheriff Chitwood. He is never a loss for words, but this man is dedicated to just making sure his people are okay. And when I say his people, I'm talking everybody from civilian staff, custodial, to the sworn, to the command staff. I got to learn so much about what they're doing out there, it's so cool. So they actually have, most agencies have an agency chaplain, right? right. We all know about the agency chaplains. He has 
many agency <laughs> chaplains. So each sector of the Volusia Sheriff's Office has a chaplain mm -hmm. assigned to the patrol zone, and they are constantly proactively checking on their people, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Even the comm center. We always forget. We talk about the men and women out on the streets. Mm -hmm. But our dispatchers are truly the first yeah. responder. They are the first one taking that call. And you just think about that, listening to this all yeah. day long. How do you get rid of that? You've got to talk about it. So Sheriff Chitwood does have a chaplain assigned there. It's, it was an amazing conversation to be able to sit with an agency head and, and truly just talk about what mm -hmm. is real. Talk about the things we talk about mm -hmm. with each other here during the breaks, the things we're going through. To have a man that leads a, a, an army, I get to, to say, mm -hmm. to talk about the vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. it's a really big deal. And I think it's encouraging to hear how he's working to change culture and making communication more 100%. open. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we were talking about that. The mm -hmm. older generation of law enforcement, you know, they went through a lot in the beginning of, uh, of their time. And we're always afraid to give up that gun, give up that badge, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden, what, I can't do the job anymore? I'm not good enough? Yeah. And he is making it very clear, take a break. It's okay, we don't want you to get burnt out. You know, Bridget, that's so right. Just to, to, these people need to understand there is no stigma anymore. Mm -hmm. If you need a break, you can have a break, even if your job is has a whole high profile as that. And it was interesting how he talked about the cycling of it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just kind of need mm -hmm. to be taken away from the day in and day out of what you see all mm -hmm. the time and then move to something a little different. Doesn't mean you can't go back. It's right. just, you, you literally just need to unplug from yeah. that. We had rotation. An, yes. A little rotation and you don't get complacent. I'm a big mm -hmm. believer yeah. in that and just routine law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Cycle people through so that you don't get mm -hmm. complacent. One thing that him and I, I wanted to address real quick that him and I talked off camera about. And it, it, it is a, a thing that law the community looks at and people think cops are so eager to get that mm -hmm. gun out of a holster. I'm going to yeah. tell you from personal experience, it is a very intense moment. It is a personal moment. And we, we remember that. And I get right. real angry. And we, we're, what I say by angry is, is who as we as humans, he said the human race, why should we as law enforcement officers have to pull a firearm on another human for them just to abide by certain things? It is a very stressful moment. Right. So as a member of the media that represents law enforcement, I just wanted to make sure that message get out. We don't want to do that stuff. We want to be safe out there. We want to be a community. So Sheriff Chitwood, thank you so much for sitting with us. Great we appreciate interview. it. Yes, that was such a good conversation, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.